Welcome to DevOps Bootcamp Lesson 6 on the boot process and file system hierarchy. Although we will be doing it in the opposite order, first we're going to talk about what's on the file system, and then we'll talk about boot once you have a but to kind of have your bearings a bit more. So if you've got your Vagrant VM working, you should pull that up, um, SSH into it now, because you'll want to look around on its file system and follow along with what we're doing. Um, so to start out, what is a file system? It's a thing that stores files on it. We've talked about files before, so you have some ideas about what attributes they have, um, how they can be interacted with, and so forth. Um, file systems can be used to mean two different things. So one of them is which files do we have and where do they go? And that's what we're going to be talking about primarily today. The other thing is how the little ones and zeros down there on the disk are actually arranged in order to um, have various traits, um, redundancy, journaling, um, availability, error correction, and any of a number of other things. So these are the names of that type of file system. Um, some of them will ring a bell. Um, you will have seen them when you're doing a Linux installation if you've ever installed it on your laptop where you get to pick what, how you want to format the partition. But today we're mostly talking about what files are there on the Linux file system, what do they do, and what can you do with them. So at the top level, if you cd to slash and then you ls, you'll see something more or less like this stuff. Most of these um, directories are common across all systems. A few of the extras um, are remnants from the installation um, and maybe system specific, but most of them are just every Linux system will have them. So. The places where your programs get installed, um, where your package manager will put your programs, or where you will if you're being organized, and um, or when a program installs itself when you run a script, are going to be bin for your binaries, um, sbin for um, sometimes for super user binaries, um, sometimes user bin, um, and sometimes other places in user. So to see that that's a bunch of different places where your program might be installed. And when you invoke it, when you just put the name of the program on your command line, your system needs to know which of those places to use the program from. This is where path comes in. Um, path, that's just a little short bash script there, echo path, is a variable that the bash has access to. And it stores separated by colons all of the places and in what order it should look for a given program. Um, You'll also notice at the start of scripts, um, like when we did the Python scripting and the bash scripting, you'll start off your um, script with the shebang and then location of what you want to execute it, like bin bash or user bin Python or what have you. Um, that's just to make sure that you're using it from the right part of your path. And then if you're wondering, so I have like three different bashes installed and they're all in different places, which one, which one am I actually using? Use which. It'll tell you what will be used if you invoke that command. Um, your user specific configuration. So anything that goes with your account is going to be in your home door, like we've talked about before. Um, and as we've mentioned before, your configurations, like your bash RC and your vimrc, will be in your doc files. So you may have noticed a thing on the top level of the file system called lost and found. And a common misconception is, oh, that's like the recycle bin or something. That is not. That is for um, block level stuff. So blocks are very low level units that the file system um, handles. And occasionally it will find one of those units and not know what to do with it. But it has data in it. And so it's like, well, what, what do I do? I shouldn't just arbitrarily delete the data, I've got to put it somewhere, and so it'll put it in lost and found. Um, you probably won't have to worry about this um, to begin with. If you, that, that place where files go, when you delete the file and you realize you didn't want to delete the file, which is a bad thing to do, you should have everything backed up, you should have everything in version control. If you have that at all, it will be something that your desktop environment provides, and 
it'll be somewhere in your home or it won't be in lost and found. So another thing that the file system does is it exposes the various drives that you have available to you. So um, where slash is mounted, it's going to be some partition of your local disk or a virtual disk, it's actually a file if you're in your virtual machine. Um, every time you plug in a new device, like when you plug in a USB stick directly onto your system, it may not work exactly like this in your VM, um, it'll show up in dev. And this is just the raw device, it's not mounted yet, you can't really interact with it the way you would expect to be able to yet. Um, and it will get as arbitrarily assigned some name. Um, you can use the message to find what name it got if your system doesn't automatically mount it, which a desktop system will often automatically mount a drive, but that's not something you want a server to do. Um, when you're doing real systems administration, you want to manually tell it exactly what to do with each disk, because you'll often have your disks in some form of um, redundancy, and you don't want your system to just be guessing. So, Pipe the message into tail because you only care about the very end of what it said. You care about the most recent event. And you will see that's what happened when I plugged in a USB stick into my laptop. Um, it got assigned to SDB because SDA was my hard drive in here. So when, once you mount it, um, the USB file system will be mounted under media. Um, the main disk will be mounted at slash, like I said. Um, if it doesn't automatically mount itself, or if you're on a server, you can manually mount it using a command, which is conveniently named mount. Um, everything acts more or less like a file, as we've mentioned before, but mount allows it to be interacted with um, in a more useful manner, more or less. So you've, you've mounted it, and now you're done with it. You want to remove it. Um, safely, that's where you mount comes in to unmount it. There's no in and you mount, um, be, beware of that. So the things that get mounted automatically, like the way that your main disk gets mounted during boot, um, that will be based on a file called etsyfs tab. You can actually look at that right now in your, in your VM, um, see what it says. It'll tell things where they should mount. And then once things are mounted, either manually or automatically, they will show up in the M tab. Um, shows you what's going on. So now we've got files, we've got them mounted. Um, how do we find how much space they have? That's DF and DU. DF for disk free, easy to remember. DU for disk usage. There are a bunch of different options which you can get out of the man page, as you all know by now. Um, the most useful option is dash H for human readable. Without the dash H, you will just get a big long glob of numbers that's uh, seven or eight or nine digits, and you can't really tell at a glance whether it means anything, instead of the convenient little sizes and gigs. So, and then if you run DU without the dash S for short, you'll get more information than you knew what to do with, because it will look at every single file and directory and tell you the size of every single one of them on your disk. Um, so try those commands and look at their man pages to see what um, options are available. So there's um, where things go in the file system is kind of based on what they're going to be used for, and we're going to talk about all of these um, different areas. So root, that single slash, is the really important stuff, um, the stuff that you need for booting up and so forth. Um, User is more or less just ordinary operation, and then user local and so forth will mostly be your locally installed software. Um, so here is the first half of all the directories. Yeah, there's another slide like this as well. So um, bin is going to be your binary files. Um, that's stuff that's being compiled and installed. Um, include is. Have you ever written a C or a C++ program and been like, include standard io.h or standard library or something? And the system just magically knows that that file's out there somewhere and it includes the right one and your program works. Well, that's because it went out to include and it got it. Um, lib is just a bunch of libraries. 
again, when you have a library that you're using and it just works, that's because it was um, living there and waiting for you to call on it. Um, SBIN, again, is a super user binary, so there are some utilities which only root will use or which will work differently for root. Um, boot contains the kernel in at RAMFS stuff, which Lance will go into a lot more detail on um, later in this talk. Um, dev is exports the hardware devices. It's where the files which are analogous to those devices will show up for you to interact with, like where something shows up, um, the USB stick when you first plug it in, for instance. Um, Etsy are where your system-wide configurations live. So we talked about how in your home directory you'll have your user-specific configurations. These are the things that apply to just everything on the system. Homeders, you know about them. Media is the place that you've mounted your storage. It's um, con convenient and pretty. Um, mount is often when you're manually mounting a disk, you'll just mount it to mount because that's what you do. Um, opt is extra packages. Um, PROC is a very cool part of the file system. It's more or less your physical system and the parts of that system that you can either um, read from or sometimes write to to take direct control over the hardware. Um, it'll tell you what hardware you're running on. There's things in it to tell you what version, and we'll look at that a bit in the upcoming slide. So root is the super users, the root user's homeder. Um, root is special. It doesn't have a regular home because it's not a regular user. Um, this exports kernel objects for you to um, read from, sometimes write to. Um, temporary files show up in temp. Um, they'll often, you often expect them to be deleted on reboot. Um, var is the most usefully named thing ever, data which will change. You'll, in practice, find um, var triple dub on most web servers. Um, var www and then a bunch of site names if you're if you're in shared hosting um, because I mean the content of a website is going to vary I guess and that's just where you where you host sites from um, user share are more files that make your programs go and user source will not be available on all systems but if you have the kernel source code that's where that will be um, so a few cool proc tricks you can cat various things. Um, prop version will have exactly what Linux you're running, um, which is really useful. You don't always know when you've gone out to a server exactly what you're working with. Um, CPU info and mem info will tell you more than you ever realized there was to know about what you're running on. Um, one of the examples, um, proc ACPI has a bunch of power management stuff, which if you're running Linux natively on your laptop will be helpful to you. It, um, that's where the battery readouts some place like right here are going to come from um, if you have readouts on a taskbar. And then you can also write to various locations. Um, that particular example shows you how to drop caches. Basically, if your memory is filling up um, because you have a bunch of cached things and you just want everything to go away, um, all of the stuff that's temporarily being stored, then you echo three for drop all three types to um, the drop caches location, and then your programs will be a little bit slower for a bit because nothing is cached, but you'll suddenly free up a whole bunch of memory. Um, so for working with file systems, um, the command which makes a file system is makefs, um, easy to remember. It has a wide variety of options that go with it. Check the man page. Um, to mount a file system, as we mentioned, um, Mount, you tell it what you want to mount and where you want to mount it to. And then loopback devices are you use low setup for. And that make, turns your file into a device. There's pretty neat things you can do setting up a file as a loopback device, mounting it someplace, and treating it like a disk. And there are a variety of tutorials that you can follow on that, which I'll link you to from the site once we're done. <coughs> You, so, so you like devices, so I put a device on your device, so that, anyways. So the dev file system, um, the SDs are SDA, SDB, they're your disks. Um, there are a few dev special thing um, files that we, I believe, have mentioned in the past briefly. So dev knowledge, just nothing's there. Um, 
they have random is random uh, values. Um, U random is a different method of generating those random values. Zero is just full of zeros. Uh, these are things that are occasionally needed, and so we have them available, more or less. So just so you know, block size is an attribute that systems will have. Um, a file takes up a series of blocks, and they the size will vary depending on your configuration. You'll need to know that um, for some commands, like DD has some options for it. Um, DD is a fun and terrifying command. So disk duplicator or disk dump, it's just take the exact values. I don't even care. Don't think about it. Just take this file or location and put it over there. I don't care what was there. I don't care whether uh, I don't care about any of that. Just just do it. So. If is where your is your input file and all of is your output file. Don't get them confused. Really, don't. Um, so, what what will this do? <laughs> so, people who don't already know um, newbies, let let's look through this. So, DD just duplicate if. So, what's it going to do with the if file? Just just yell at me here. Input. Yes, it's going to take his input. Thank you, Checker, for pretending to be a newbie. Um, what, what are we going to find in dev random? Yes, random numbers. All. What's it going to do with the all location? It's going to output them to. And then, do you remember what's on dev SDA? Yeah, that's your that's your main bit. So that's a very very bad thing to do. Um, read DD commands with skepticism and care and caution because they can really mess things up. Um, so another thing to note about file systems is that there is two types of information on them. There is metadata, and then there's data. So if I have like a Hello World script, then the content of that script is going to be the data. It's the, the file itself. Metadata is going to be traits like file name, last modified time, who modified it, what are its permissions, and so forth. All that extraneous stuff that the file system has to track in order to know where it is and what it's doing. Um, the file system, we call it consistent if all of the metadata is intact. We know where all these files came from. We know who did things to all these files. Um, it's kind of the system knows that it hasn't lost any of its memory that way. Um, and FISC is the file system consistency check, which you can run on a disk to see if its file system is consistent. Um, we go into a little bit of depth on journaling. Basically, each file system does journaling differently. The reason you want journaling is because um, as you get into operating systems, you'll learn about um, you learn about memory management and sharing between processes, and basically. If your system crashes when you're halfway through writing something, you need some way of figuring out how far you got through writing it and either undoing that write entirely or finishing it up. And a journal helps you um, helps you keep track of what you were doing and not leave things half finished if your system goes down or if something breaks. So instead of just writing straight onto a disk, you um, talk to a journal and then from the journal it goes to disk and then you can look up the journal. Um, in, if you replay, and then replay it if you need to recover. Um, so with that, um, do we have any questions on file system topics that we covered before I hand it over to Lance to talk about boot? Yeah? Um, you mentioned dev random and dev random. Uh-huh. different. I don't, How are they different? Um, I don't have to recall the... One is a little bit better with randomness than other. It uses a different random number generator, mm -hmm. basically. Check it. Uh, I was under the impression that random was blocking in that uh, if it can't, it like tries really hard to get truly random numbers, <coughs> and it does that by like gathering like entropy or whatever, which is probably it, it's really complex. But basically, it tries to gather randomness, and if it can't get enough, then you won't be able to recover. Oh, yeah. it. But you random will always produce. Random numbers, mm -hmm. but it'll it'll fall back on a pseudo random number generator. Yeah. yeah. It varies between different systems mm -hmm. a bit too, I think. But 
Cool. So would you like the projector yeah. for this? Yes. Okay. Um, would you like power? Or? Nope. Okay. Okay, so then if you um, give the Hangout your screen share, then I'll mute my mic so it doesn't... Yeah, I should have it. Okay, um, and if you unmute your mic... Probably should be working now. Let's see here. Am I working? Hello? It's hearing your voice but not showing your screen. Um. So if you, if you start screen share again, I think. I'm trying. Is it still going anywhere? Um, mine is not. You might stop your screen share. Okay. Um, uh, I'll mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Shall we just run the slides from my screen? Um, how about I leave and you add me back? Ah, there we go. So, I was looking at the other side. <laughs> could you join into it from the OSLs Plus page? Um, um, I'll bet you if you go to use um, to use Google Plus as the OSL, and then go to Hangouts, it'll let you join in. Yeah. Um, we will clip this part out of the video once we get it working. <laughs> So yeah, I think if you go to use Google Plus as OSL and then go to Hangouts, it should just be on the screen, like working on yeah, it. like I have it there. I think it, it, it should have noticed. Right? Ah, oh, uh, I see from your camera. <laughs> Hello. 
There we go. I see your screen. Apologize for that. Okay. <laughs> so the boot process. Um, how many of you have ever wanted to know how the boot process actually works on a machine? Cool. <laughs> this is obviously very Linux heavy, but it kind of I'm kind of gonna go over the bootstrapping process, kind of the steps in a Linux Unix system, go over a little bit about bootloaders and what they do, startup scripts, and kind of talk about boot levels in some some capacity. Um, so bootstrapping, as, as the saying goes, is like pulling yourself up with your own bootstraps. Um, in the Linux world, there's automatic booting, which basically is your normal boot level, or you can do a manual booting, where you can say, only boot to a certain level so I can work on the system. That's kind of like a safe mode, so to speak. Um, during the bootstrapping phase, that's when you're getting your drivers to load. So that's when you're being able to figure out, oh, I have a disk. I should do something with the disk. I have this other network device. I should do something with it. Um, during the bootstrapping process, it's also kind of a period of vulnerability. So if you have something screwed up in your configuration, this would probably be the place it would happen. You know, maybe you pulled out a card and there's bad hardware. During the boot process, you'll probably see an error. Maybe it runs okay when it's been running and you reboot the machine and suddenly stuff stop, stops working. That's usually what happens, at least in the server world. Um, or you had some kind of problem with the file system and it has it. Issues. So it's kind of what you have to worry about. Um, something to always consider is when you boot in a Linux system, there always has to be a first process that runs that spawns everything else. And in this case, it's always referred to as init. Um, <clears throat> init can be as simple as a binary or as a shell script. It can even be the bash shell. <laughs> um, I'll show you doing that. Um, but it's usually a, a binary that kind of has its uh, a lot of logic built in to take care of the rest of the system. Um, but it can be, it can do quite a bit of, bit of things. It's always the process D number one, though. Everything off of it is is uh, after one, obviously. So steps in the boot process. So the kernel is the actual operating system, in this case, Linux kernel uh, boots up. So the kernel initializes. It goes through its whole routine. Um, it gets to a certain point, and then it hands it off to init. And then init does its stuff. Um, but I guess I should say, in between all of that, the kernel might be doing some kernel configuration automatically, finding devices, it does its whole thing, and once it hands it off to the init process, the init process goes, okay, now I need to go do something. I need to do the rest of this. So it does some pre-initialization tasks that kind of maybe set up some processes it may need. Um, if you have single user mode set, the init will say, okay, I'm in single user mode. I need to do this now, and it does it. Um, and then it basically goes through a whole process of starting up a bunch of services that are needed to run the system, whether it's setting up networking, starting SSHD, um, starting up X so you can have a desktop, whatever. You know, there's a whole set of things. Um, and the, the eventual goal is to get in the multi-user operation, which is when you get to a front, um, and so forth. So it, it can be quite a process, um, but that's kind of the basics and the steps. Um, as far as booting goes, you need a bootloader. So once the system uh, boots up, you usually you see BIOS, um, at least in the PC world now. Um, it's a really simple, stupid you know, boot, bootloader, essentially, is what it is. And it's, it, it's not standardized at all across the board. It's been around for a long time in the PC world. Uh, but it does the job. And it basically allows you to you know, configure the system. Maybe you want to turn off hardware virtualization turn things on and off, but compared to other uh, uh, firmware for uh, hardware, it's pretty simple. Um, if you get into other proprietary systems, for example, Sun systems, well, not Oracle, but um, Spark hardware, you know, they have something called Open Boot Prom, which is completely different. Um, in the old days, if you ran a Mac with a PowerPC, it also used a similar system with its boot. Um, um, even on our Android phones, um, there's a bootloader that's a little bit different, or a BIOS, so to speak. Um, kind of a new one that's coming up now, it's, well, it's been up for a while, but it's finally getting utilized, is uh, UEFI. So it's basically the next generation of BIOS. And it extends a lot what you can do. Um, it makes it a little more complicated in some cases. The operating system has to know about it, but it essentially can take care of, it has a lot more logic built into it. So it literally can do netbooting from itself, where on a BIOS, 
that by itself probably doesn't have netboot code. Um, there's probably a, a, a network interface card that has that code built into it, but maybe not necessarily into the BIOS. So the BIOS is the first thing it takes over when, when the system boots up. It gets everything initialized and goes forth. And then it hands it off to the bootloader. And this is where the fun begins. Um, these slides are from an old presentation I gave, and I used to have slides about Lilo, which is the old uh, Linux bootloader. Um, thankfully, we never have to deal with that anymore, but Lilo had the uh, notorious habit of if you forgot to run Lilo after making a configuration change, you couldn't boot your system. It was not dynamic. It was a very static setup. Well, the nice thing about Rub is that it's very dynamic. So when it boots up, you can actually edit the menu. You can go in. It has a very uh, minimalistic command prompt that I can show you. Um, now we've gotten into a situation where there's two different versions of Grub. There's the old kind, version 1, as we call it, but it's technically version .99, <laughs> um, that I'm actually showing what the prompt looks like. And now the newer version of Grub 2, which is a little bit different, um, they made a lot of different changes in Grub 2, mainly in the configuration file format. So it's to the point where it uses a bunch of other scripts to generate the config file to basically make it better and more smart. But in that case, you don't really ever edit the main boot menu config file anymore. And I'll show you that actually here uh, in a second. Um, most of your modern Linux distributions now will use Grub2. Um, uh, CentOS 6, which is one of the, our default VM, actually is still using Grub1, um, which is kind of nice because it's easier to teach. <laughs> Uh, but Grub2 kind of can be interesting. So um, I guess I'll go ahead and kind of show you this. Um, one thing you'll have to do is open up your Vagrant file. And there's this line here that says VB GUI. You want to uncomment that so that it'll show you the actual console of VirtualBox when it boots up. And then we can get in the Grub. Otherwise, because we're working before SSH and everything. So it's kind of fun. So I'm going to go ahead and just type Vagrant up and wait for my machine to boot up. Um, Grub by default has a timeout. So on some systems, especially on Ubuntu systems, like if you have it on your laptop, you may not see the boot menu because by default they want it to boot as fast as it can. So unless you know the special key to hit, it'll just go straight through and you don't see the menu. My poor little laptop. So right here is, gr is Grub. I quickly hit a, a menu, or a button, any kind of button. So here's the menu. I only have one kernel listed in here. Um, if I wanted to, I can go straight to the command line prompt that Grub has. So I can type help, help. It gives me all these options. I, I pressed C. And so like here it doesn't like my command at all. Um, and I think I've hit escape. It takes me back. So here it tells you a little bit. Um, you can edit it in line. So if I press E, it will literally show me the information that's for this boot. So here it's telling me that the disk for root, and it's index based, is disk 0, which is the first disk, partition 0, which is where boot actually exists. And then inside of that, it points to where the kernel image is, and then it gives some arguments. And then we have an init RD, which is basically, I don't go into detail in this talk about it, but basically it does magical things to get the devices to show up on systems during the boot process. That the kernel by itself can do, but in certain situations it doesn't do it good enough. <laughs> um, and you can literally edit. So if I type E, I can get to this line, and I can see all these things in here. Um, I can modify them. Uh, but it's only modifying at this particular point. So right now, it's set to quiet. So what that means is when it boots, you don't see the kernel messages coming up. But if I take this off, um, and I hit Enter, and I press B to actually boot, um, you'll see the kernel actually flying by with everything um, going through. And you can see the system boot up.
Um, in this particular case, what this is doing is I'm setting this manually. So here I'm wanting to actually install the master boot record, the MBR, onto the system. I tell it, put it on this partition, or that's where the boot partition resides. Set up, actually installs Grub, and then I quit to get out of it. Or you could run Grub install, which will magically quote quote figure it out and do it for you. Secret user mode is really, really handy when you get into a situation where the system is having issues. Say, for example, I've had a problem where I have a network file system, and maybe I'm having net issues with my networking not connecting. And when it tries to boot, it gets to the point where it tries to mount the network file system, and it just hangs and hangs and hangs and hangs. And like, well, how do I ever get to the system if it does that? Well, if you reboot the system and get into single user mode, you'll get into a certain level where the networking doesn't even come up, and you can diagnose and fix things. So you don't need to boot up a live CD or something and fix it. Um, you can also do file system checks manually if you wanted to. It gets your system in a quies state, so to speak, so that it, it gets it so that very minimal processes are running. It's not running any processes like UDEV or the system log or anything. It's very basic. It just has a prompt. You can do things. Um, it's really easy to get into sync or user mode. Some operating systems or Linux distributions already have a single user mode rescue option in the boot menu, but CentOS doesn't have that. So let me go ahead and reboot. And I'll show you how you can easily do it from the grub prompt. So here I usually hit escape. Then I edit, E. I go to the kernel line and I hit E there. And then I just add single at the end. Um, type the word single, it usually tells the init uh, process to go into single user mode. So I press that, I press B, and the system is booting up, and boom, I'm there. Um, depending on the operating system and how it's set up, it may ask you for the, the root password. So you'll have to know the root password to get to this point. But if I run, you know, processes, there's basically no processes other than the very basics. Um, I don't have any networking set up. Um, I have, you know, I can see my disk. I don't know if I can write to it. Yeah, I can. Um, sometimes it boots up and it, you can't write to it, but it's a very, very basic system. Um, and in a couple of slides, I'll show you what you can do to get out of this mode if you want to say, hey, I fixed what was going on. You know, let's move on. Um, and other, like in Solaris or BSD, it might be a different command. Um, there's different ways you can get into it. So startup script test. So when the system boots up, um, it does a variety of things. So for example, it sets the host name. It tells it what time zone it should be in. It starts checking the disks for uh, file system checks. And it, it'll say, oh, it's been this long. I need to automatically do this. Um, in this case, this particular computer hadn't been checked in 666 <laughs> days. <laughs> um, uh, it mounts system disks. It mounts network disks. It, you know, it can do a variety of things. It sets up the networking. Um, you know, it starts up daemon and network services. So there's a there's an order of presence that things happen while you do that. Um, some history and some of the stuff I'm talking about is kind of in flux in the Linux world. But some history. Um, all Linux init systems are based on what's called the System Five boot style. Um, and the idea is that um, you have different run levels, and each run level uh, gets you to the next step where you want to get. So when you're in level 0, you're halting the machine. When you're in level 1 or S, you're in single user mode. Um, 1 through 5 is essentially multi-user levels. Typically, 3 is getting you up to networking, and that's it. So maybe it starts up networking, but it doesn't start SSH, for example. Um, and then. On desktop, desktop systems, and depending on the distro, 5 can be like startup X, so to speak. Um, if you type, or if you use init 6, init 6 means reboot. Um, now, there's alternatives to the system 5 boot style that are coming up. Um, there's system D, which is really new, and then there's upstart. Um, upstart is typically with Ubuntu. Um, but something I actually realized when I was doing these slides is that CentOS 6 actually uses Upstart. Um, uh, but it's all backwards compatible to the System 5 system. Um, basically, these both do same or the similar things. They just do it differently and have different goals in mind. Um, 
the goal of Upstart was to make the system boot as fast as possible. So in the original old system buy setup, things were done serially. So you set this starts, then this starts, and then this starts, and then this starts. Well, the idea of Upstart is, is well, I want to be event-driven. When I start up this part of it, then I should be able to do these other things in parallel because they don't need a startup serial. And so it starts a whole bunch of things that follow us, um, which creates some unique problems when you're trying to have network devices or things. Like when they had, when they first started using Upstart, I remember seeing System Administrator and complaining about, well, I can't get this thing to work because of the bug in, in Upstart. Um, System D does essentially the same thing, but I think it's dependency driven, but it's almost replacing a bunch of other Unix tasks like cron, and it tries to do all the things, um, <laughs> so to speak. Um, but it's, it seems to be what's going to be become the de facto standard eventually. Um, I'm not even going to talk about it. I don't even have much experience myself with it, but when used properly, it's, it's, I've heard it's awesome. So it's really extensible. Um, so let's play around with some user levels. So here I'm in init 0 or in it one, let's say I want to get to the network or the, the network layer. So let's type, so all you do is you type in it three, and then it goes to the next level. So here it's bringing up my interface, and it looks like it does start, it does get a little bit further along, and it might be because of how upstart is set. It shouldn't give me a multi-user prompt, but apparently that's what it's doing here. Um, and if I want to get to in it five, It'll start some other things. So here it's starting some uh, the guest box additions to make Vagrant work properly and everything, um, and so forth. Um, this continues. Um, and if you want, you could type either reboot or you can just type in at six, and it will reboot the machine. So init tab, and init, init tab is actually kind of getting deprecated too because of upstart and systemd. They do the same thing, but they configure the files in a different way. But I wanted to tell you guys about the old way because it kind of helps you understanding it. Uh, but the init tab is basically a tab file that describes in it what to do about certain things. Um, it's, it's for <laughs> describing what to do in single user mode. In this case, it says, uh, Execute the su login command. This basically gives you a login prompt quickly. Um, when you hit, hit Control Alt Delete it, uh, on any other levels one through five, run this command. Uh, I want to create terminals. So on terminals two through five, or run levels two through five, um, create this Getty, which is a login prompt, um, and put it on the tty one terminal. Um, and it says respawn so that if I kill the Getty, it respawns it. So you can have it respawn. Um, you can do some amazing things in here. So like here, I'm setting a Getty or a login prompt to show up on the serial board with that baud rate using the VT100 uh, terminal emulation. So you can do the same thing with systemd and others. They just do it differently. Um, and it's really quite useful. Um, and if I show on this system, um, there is no init tab, or I guess there is, <laughs> but when you open it up, it basically says, <laughs> don't use this file. <laughs> and it tells you where to look. So in this case, it's using the... Uh, um, Upstart version of things, so it has its all, all its configuration and how it does things, and it's just more complicated. I like simplicity, and I don't like how that's set up. <laughs> um, but yeah, init tab. It's one of those hidden things you didn't really know about, um, that you can do some interesting things. Um, if I had time, I can boot up a, our Debian machine still uses init tab, and you can kind of take a look at it and see what interesting things you can do. Um, init scripts, or init ID scripts. These are actually starting up and starting all these services. So for example, SSHD. And most of these usually have commands, a common set of commands. Either it's start, stop, reload, or restart. 
Um, the difference between reload and restart is reload just tells the daemon, reload your configuration, but don't actually die and come back up. When you do restart, that usually means kill the process or the daemon and start it back up. So in this case, I'm saying, what's the status of the SSHD? And it tells you, hey, it's running, and there's the PID. And then I can say restart SSHD. I actually did this with the SSH connection going. You're probably wondering, how the hell does that happen? It's just magic that the SSH da daemon does when you do that. <laughs> um, uh, when you, let's, let me actually SSH in so it has a little bit better terminal. Um, historically, you would just, you go to the directory, you would go here, and you would do what you want to do. And if you just do that, it will just tell you all the commands it can do. In this case, it can do other things. Um, now in the new modern world, you can just type service, name of the service, and do the same thing. Um, it's a little bit easier to type. Um, if you want to see what it actually looks like, um, in, all, in essence, it's just a script. It's a bash script. Um, and it sources functions that are common on the system. It checks to see if it's running. It sources files to get in variables. It checks to see if keys are created in this case. Um, and it does a bunch of tasks and starts things up. It's really, really simple. And then you just have a simple case statement here. Um, this is the old init style. Um, in the new system D and upstart world, this would be done differently. You wouldn't have to do half this stuff because it would have its own little way of doing it. Um, so yeah, any questions thus far? Cool. So service is starting at boot. So here's where the run level stuff comes in. And this is still kind of the old style, but still kind of relevant. You have the RC number level dot D, and then you have a whole bunch of other things. And then just to kind of show you, if I go here, uh, you see how I have all of these RC0, RC1, RC2 directories. So if I go, sit, for example, in RC3, I have all of these files. And they're actually symlinks back to the init scripts. Uh, but you see how they have K in front of it, and then they have S, and then a number. Well, that's where the old SIS5 init, SIS init system plays. This is where it's serially telling you, when you start, do it in this order. S is for start. And then when you stop, do it in this order, stopping. Um, so it's set as a sequence. So in the case of here, uh, S55 SSH. So it does it in that order. Um, But then you're probably wondering, like in the old days, when you wanted to enable and disable services, you would basically manually create these sim links and do all this crazy stuff. But we live in a great day and age where you don't have to do that. So in the Red Hat world, you have check config to, man to, to turn things on and off. And then the Debian world, you have the update rc.d commands. They essentially do the same thing. But their intent is enabling a, a service to start and stop on boot. So here I'm saying. OK, I want to know the settings for SSHD. And here it's showing me each run level that it's supposed to be off on 0 and 1, but on 2, 3, 4, and 5, it'll be on. Um, I tell it to turn it off. This isn't stopping SSHD. It's just telling it on boot, don't start SSHD. Um, and then I list it again, and it shows that it's all off. So obviously, you want to be careful with these commands. But this is your, your way of knowing when things are on and off. Um, each distribution works differently, so your mileage may vary. Gen2 does, Gen does it in a completely different way, for example. So a lot of these edit scripts have ways of configuring it. And obviously, each distribution is different. But they all work in the same way, where it sources a config file, and then it uses that variable in the, in the init script. Um, it can be daemon arguments, it can be network settings, it can be pretty much anything you want to do. Um, in this case, I showed what the NTBD one was, and it's basically what the options you literally sent to it. Um, so that's what gets sent to it. You can look at the init uh, script to kind of see what's set, to kind of know what's going on, but that's kind of what's going on. 
So shutting down. We're not in a Windows world. A reboot won't always fix things, but sometimes it does. Um, when you're in the server world, it can take a long time, um, especially if it's a really complex server with a lot of memory. It can take a really long time. I remember back in my old days when I had Sun Machines, it would literally take 20 minutes to reboot because I had to initialize all its hardware. So you may not want to do it. Um, typically, in the Linux world, you only want to reboot to load a new kernel, although there's now features that allow you to reload a new kernel on the fly, but it's kind of scary. Um, you have new hardware, so you want to upgrade RAM. Um, even though I think Linux does support hot swap RAM, maybe your hardware doesn't. <laughs> so you don't want to do that. Um, or you have some kind of system-wide configuration change that you want to do. Um, I'm trying to think of an example of that. Um, Hostname? Huh? Hostname? Yeah, hostname is a good good thing like it. Like you can change the hostname while it's running, but it's typically best to do it with a reboot. Um, or you made a bunch of changes and you want to make sure the system boots up the way it's supposed to again. You might want to reboot to do it. Um, but typically you can do uh, run shutdown to shut down the command. And most of these I think are actually just aliases to actual init commands. Um, reboot is essentially the same thing as init 6. Halt is a similar as shutdown. Um, in the Sun world, or Sun, uh, Solaris world, there was a difference between shutting down and halting. Where shutting down brought it down when the machine was still on. And halting was literally powering off the machine. So sometimes there's differences in that. Um, and then if you ever want to have fun, um, there's a command called wall uh, where you can send a system-wide message. And that's generally nice. If you're on a system with a bunch of users and you're going to say, I'm going to reboot this machine in five minutes and you want to see something. And it's always fun when uh, you do it on a machine where everybody has an IRC screen connected. And it's going, ah, because it messes up your screen suddenly. So like in this case, I'll show you what happens. You can do it on the, oh, your own system here. And I can say, uh, or actually, let me do it from here. I'll say, hello, world. And you'll see that in both of these terminals, it shows up and it makes it really flashy and everything. Um, it's kind of annoying. Um, you look at the help for shutdown. Um, you can actually, eh, let me look here. Um, um, so you can actually tell it a time to uh, re restart. Um, so I can say, um, let's see here, what is time? Time is different formats typically. Um, so let's do shutdown one going down. So in this case, it's going to automatically shut down in one minute. And I think if I hit control C, it'll stop the process. It's like the, uh, you know, the self-destruct button kind of a thing. So in this case, I can say, like, okay, I'm going to reboot this system in five minutes. And I think every minute, it'll basically send this message to everybody to kind of flash at them. Um, and then it does its thing. So that's kind of a neat little thing you can do. And it tells you information, like, well, this came from this virtual terminal here at this time. So I know that it's somebody logged in on the SSH and not somebody in the prompt and so forth. And there's a lot of interesting things. Um, so is there any questions? There's a lot more I can cover on the boot process, but I can only do it in so much time. Um, um, and I think that was my last slide. Um, I really didn't have any homework uh, other than play with grub on the command line here. And you can see, oh, there it goes. Um, and go down. Some other things that we can cover later on in more detail is the init RAM FS. Um, it's essentially a minimalized Linux environment, and its sole purpose is to initialize hardware. Um, we haven't really gone into uh, storage-related stuff too much, but um, in some systems where you have RAID, which is you have a bunch of disks asking, acting as one, um, it's a little bit more complex on how to boot that system. Um, for example, Grub can't read a RAID 5 boot partition because it's striped. <laughs> it knows regular file systems. Um, but if you try to boot up the system, um, Linux may not be able to see that because 
it needs to initialize a bunch of drivers to get to that point. So it's a chicken and the egg problem. So an integram FS is essentially, once the kernel boots, the integram FS is like a mini Linux that runs. It does a bunch of tasks like, I'm going to set up Ray. Oh, I have logical volumes that need to get set up. And oh, I need to enable them and everything. And OK, now that I got this going, I'll switch my root to the logical volume and keep going and hand it back over to the regular edit. Um, it's a really complex thing, but you can do some really crazy, interesting stuff. Like, for example, you can make a really fancy uh, recovery console inside of a RAMFS um, on your system so you don't even need to use a uh, single user. You know, maybe you got to a point where the disks are trashed and you can't even mount to get to that point, and you maybe can't get to the live CD. Well, if you have a nice, fancy interim FS, assuming you can read that from the disk, um, you can get to that point. Um, and it looks like it put me down into single user mode because I started it from you. I don't know. Anyway, so that's what's going on there. Um, let me also show you um, another fancy thing. Um, If you ever wanted to get root on a machine, this is assuming, I guess it should work in most cases. Um, you don't know the login, then you can't get in. Um, this is the dirtiest trick in the book. Um, where is it? i got to find the point where it's at. So long. And some of these settings are specific to the distributions. Well, I, guess it, I guess it uses the default. So I can say in it, and then I can tell it whatever path I want to do it. In this case, I'm just going to tell it to be bash. <laughs> this is hardcore. Um, it, won't, it completely bypasses the init process, and literally it boots up kernel, runs bash. <laughs> but... So you have everything in Bash, but it's the most minimalist environment you have. Like I don't think I could touch anything because it mounts the file system in, in read-only. So I have to tell it to uh, remount, read-write, that. Now I can touch my file system. <laughs> um, it's the dirtiest way to get root on a box. <laughs> um, but hey, it works. Um, it's 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 definitely need to know what you're doing. Um, like there's not even like very minimalistic dev stuff running. Um, and the fun part is, is when you exit, you panic the kernel because it doesn't know how to reboot. So if I take exit, I panic. <laughs> <laughs> so fun stuff. Fun stuff you can do. When you do that, is bash stuff just one thing? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, I guess if I O control delete it, it'll uh, show that. So let me do that real quick, assuming this actually works. Um, I may actually have to power it off completely. Because, yeah, I mean, it's so minimalistic, and it isn't there to take over that stuff. So, whoops. Um, let me start it back up, and we can look and see that. But, yeah, it's essentially, it should be running as one. Um, I've done that on a very rare occasion where I can't get in. I need to, like, change... I don't know the root password. I'm like, screw it. I'm going to then bash it, and I'm in. Another thing you can do is if you point it to nothing, it'll panic as well because it can't find it. So if we look, um, then bash is one. <laughs> I think if I type reboot, it might work. Oh, unable to shut down system. <laughs> Let's try it again. Yeah, anyways. <laughs> Crazy stuff you can do. Um, but that, I think that kind of brings this one to an end. Um, any questions? Yeah. Um, uh, this may or may not be a good question for right now. But I... In my personal Linux use, I've noticed um, I have two external hard drives that are USB drives. And in the past, and actually currently, um, I changed distributions a few times, and I don't remember which distro had this behavior or not. But um, there are times when I will reboot the machine for whatever reason, and then when it comes to Grub, Grub fails to load because 
um, of the external drive. So it comes up with a UUID and says something like, I'm a recognized device. Um, and I haven't had the time to really do a lot of debugging on that beyond just like, well, I'll just turn these drives off to boot and then turn them on um, and let them out that way. But in the past, um, on one distro or another, it's recognized that it had no problem booting whether those drives are on or off. And I'm curious, is there a way to go into Grub and like, edit some? So, and I was about, I, I realized I had to show it everybody this. So if you go in the slash boot, that's where you'll see um, all these files. So here you can see, um, here's the actual kernel. Here is the Instagram FS, and then there's other information in there. If you wanted to see the actual config for how that kernel was built, most distributions include it. So this is literally the configuration for that kernel. Um, if you go into the Grub directory, at least on Grub 1 systems, you'll see all of these. Um, and the way Grub works is they have different stages, and then it hands it off to the kernel. So it needs a way of reading all systems, essentially. So it's a one and a half stage. Um, um, but typically, you look at the grub config. Um, and then in the grub config, it sets the default kernel that's going to boot, in this case, index is 0. There's only one listed. Uh, I'm going to wait five seconds. Um, I'm going to have a fancy splash image that shows you stuff when it boots. Um, I'm going to have the menu hidden by default, which is why it says, like, I'm going to boot this and time it down. And then it has all the information. Um, depending on how this is set up on your system, you see where it says root equals UUID, blah, 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 blah. If it says dev, SD, whatever, depending on what, how that was plugged in, the ordering might get messed up. So maybe when it boots up, it for some reason sees the USB drives before everything else, and it gets confused. Um, and that's why in Grub, it typically uses the UUID, which is a unique <coughs> identifier to the file system. And so it scans it and it says, oh, this file system has this UUID. I'm going to mount this. So that's one way it works around that. Um, so if I went in there and just ensured that new ID was an actual drive instead yeah. of the actual drive. Yeah, and you have to use some other tools to kind of get to it. Um, to kind of get to it. I think it's a, a block ID, I think, and like Yeah. So that tells you if UUID is that, that's ext4. Um, but it should, I think that's actually what was in Grub. Nope. There it is. So the root being where the root slash is at is the 88 one, which is what's listed there. Um, if I do SDA, yeah, it doesn't return anything because it's literally that. So. And in case you guys didn't re figure it out, the numbers represent the partition numbers of the disk. So SDA is the disk, and SDA2 is one partition. In the, in the Windows world, that would be like partition, or SDA1 would be like C drive, um, and then each other partition would be another lettered uh, partition, essentially. OK, cool. Um, I think next week um, we will be talking about databases um, with Justin Duggar. So I think it's going to be interactive, using some tools online to kind of work through some simple SQL stuff. So it'll be a lot of fun. Um, and then I think we have a week off, um, and then we'll dive into more more security stuff and go from there. Do you know if that's um, MySQL or SQLite? I think it'll be MySQL. We were debating on that for many times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was basically my SQL versus my SQL versus Postgres, and we're probably going to go with my SQL. And we're going to help you guys actually add to that big integration into the app that we've been developing as well. So if you have a chance to look at an issue and make pull requests on GitHub, this is a really good time to track. Cool. All right. Well, thanks for coming out. Thank you for teaching us. Thanks. Yes.